with us, Dr. Raju Malhotra ji, and we have arranged different interactions with him with different uh, sectors. We had the press meet earlier, and now is the business meet. So we have uh, with us our founder chairman, Dr. T. H. Choudhury also, on the dais sitting next to him. I have <coughs> Mr. Mr. Naredi, Ashish Naredi, from he was ex ISB, and we have Mr. Raghav Krishna also. They, they, the purpose of this meeting is to bring about Dr. Mr. Raju Malhotra's views about the India perception about this thing to all of us here. So th this would be like a <coughs> question and Q and A session, and um, <coughs> Mr. Ashish and Mr. Raghu Krishna will uh, make the you know put up the questions. The purpose is to enlighten the audience about what needs to be done. Uh, we as a society, as a nation, for our economy and for strengthening our country. So <coughs> I now request. Uh, where are you? Okay. <clears throat> we'll go for a very brief introduction, self-introduction of Mr. Krishna as well as Mr. Ashish Naredi. Yeah. Namaste, everyone. Uh, I'll keep it really brief. The first introduction, I think, should be a fanboy moment. Uh, having read uh, Rajivji's books and having grown up and having your own cycle of enlightenment, if I could call it so, that's the first introduction. Second is, uh, yes, I am an uh, ISB alumnus. I've uh, had a brief stint in my family business, then worked with uh, some corporates, then started my own industries, and now the latest venture is a school called uh, Indic International School at uh, Kompali, and uh, that's what I'm currently doing. Thank you. Namaste. Uh, my name is Raghava Krishna. I run a cultural research organization called Brihat Culture Creative. Uh, we work at the intersection of cultural storytelling, creative art, and Indian knowledge systems based education. So we uh, partner with uh, universities, with institutions, and uh, creative organizations that are advancing the public narratives on uh, Indian culture. And extremely delighted and honored to be staring the stage with Rajivji. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, what we'd request is uh, Rajiv D, Rajivji to uh, give his introductory remarks and what's his broad message for the audience. Because this time the interaction we see is uh, very differently organized. He's meeting with a very specific set of uh, individuals. This is for the businessmen's meeting. He's having separate meetings with the intellectuals, with the cinema people, with the press and all. So uh, a brief vision or uh, direction from your side in terms of the intent behind this and what are your broad message points to it. And then from there, we can take it up as a Q&A, uh, whoever may be having the questions. Okay. Namaste, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm coming to Hyderabad after a very long time, maybe 50 years or something. I was here as a young kid long ago, Sikandarabad, and I have a lot of memories. Uh, so, glad to be here. <clears throat> now, the question is uh, my thoughts on the business situation in India. Uh, you know, uh, the good news is that the Vaishya, which is business, uh, Varna is re regaining, and we're getting a good uh, share of world economy. GDP is growing well. So that means that the, as far as the material prosperity is concerned, we are getting back. Uh, and this is necessary because only with material resources we can invest in other things, and political, military, all that, because you need to be a strong economy. So that is the good news. The issue is the quality of growth, not the number, the GDP, but what's the quality of growth. And if you look at GDP growth rate, and break it into growth rate of the top tier, growth rate of the middle tier, growth rate of the bottom tier, what will you get? And I don't know if anybody looks at it that way, but it ought to be looked at that way. Because if the top tier is the one growing fastest, 
then the rich are getting richer, which is how I feel is the case. Uh, and the poor are not getting their share of the effect. Now, why I say that is that the, uh, the uh, employment situation for youth at the bottom is not that good. They're surviving because is that um, uh, the government is subsidizing the lives of the uh, lower strata. Uh, it is good that the government is giving housing and medicine and education and food and uh, free uh, uh, fuel and water. So those are good things, but uh, it should not be necessary. Uh, the better would be if the government said that uh, uh, there are so many people who don't need any of this. The fact that we need to give economic subsidies of various kinds for people to make their ends meet is not good because it means they're not productive enough to carry their own weight. They're not productive enough. Some, uh, they're productive to uh, fill that margin. And this means it's a drain on the economy to have people. So when you say we have a youth dividend, I, I could also say we have a youth liability. And while there are brains to work and hands to work, uh, that, that is only applicable if there are jobs to do. Otherwise, there are mouths to feed and stomachs to feed. And uh, potential uh, emotional uprisings and violence and uh, uh, unrest because uh, unemployed youth are a very dangerous thing. So when you look at the Indian economy, it could be that the growth is lopsided. And this is something that needs to be given more attention. Now, I have a special background and interest in artificial intelligence, and I feel that that's making things worse. Uh, I've read all the reports from the Indian government, all these. Um, industrial groups and so on. And I'm very disappointed important issues. Uh, it is true that AI will kill jobs and also create jobs. It is true. But the people who, the kind of people who will get the jobs are different than the kind of people who lose the jobs. You may lose jobs in some poor village in Bihar or somewhere where they're doing labor intensive work and gain jobs in Bangalore or Hyderabad or somewhere where people of a different strata will gain jobs. So, but that means there is a disruption of society when you do that. It will be, it will, could also be that uh, certain new type of uh, economies will develop, new industries will develop, which will require capital, and those who already have the capital will invest in them and get even richer, and it will get away, do away with the whole lot of other, other economies which are very intensive. So I think that the, uh, the, the authorities in India, the experts in India, the government and industrial people and political people have not done a good, honest job of the impact of it. Like, for instance, I saw a report, by, a, a book by uh, Chandrasekhar on this uh, future, on this uh, year. Hey, you know that. And uh, economic attitude, which is really, do the reality. Yeah, yeah. So, I read that book. And, and, yeah. And in that book, it makes a, it, 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 it gives a kind of a claim on uh, uh, how this, uh, MSMEs will benefit. Uh, and I looked through it in great detail to see how did they come up with this forecast, this percentage, this numerical prediction, how did they come up with it? And it uh, very small little for end note. So I went to the end note and it refers to some report somewhere from overseas. And I looked at that report. That report talked about some data from Germany and Brazil. And I don't know how you take data from Brazil and Germany and come up with a conclusion that this is the this is the data of India that is applicable and here based on that we're doing this. And why they pick those two? Because they will fit their needs. So I don't feel <coughs> confident. And these are, these are very credible people. I have a lot of respect for them. But I'm just telling you this particular point. And like this I could go on and tell you a whole lot of issues. 
Now, there was a AI conference, India loves to have these conferences because we feel that that means we're advancing. There was some AI conference uh, two, three years ago. I was producing, I was just out getting my, my book on artificial intelligence and I saw this conference and I thought I should be the speaker. So I tried getting in and nobody wanted me to speak. Okay, so then I talked to Rajiv Kumar who was the vice chairman of Niti Aayog at the time and because he's uh, ex Tibetan and a fellow who I knew personally, I just said to him that, you know, I am writing a book, nobody has written a book, no Indian has written a book on policy, society, impact on India, people have written from the western perspective but I am writing from the Indian perspective, there is no such book like that and I am writing so I should at least get his points. So he got me in, he wrote to somebody who was organizing and the argument was not uh, he's written a book and knows a lot about it. The argument was, he's my uh, fellow uh, classmate, so please accommodate him. I felt insulted. That is not the kind of a... But anyway, I went for uh, this uh, Zoom thing. And the uh, person from some Nithya Yoke type place or wherever he was, some government civil bureaucrat type who was running that particular panel, made sure I'm the last speaker. And then, then it was like, we're running out of time, sir, you know, can we just hurry up and all that stuff. So I just gave it to him. I said, you know, i waited a long time. None of these people have written a book. I have written a book. None of the ideas are well known. The other aspect is data privacy. Now, I am surprised at the level of uh, foolishness and, uh, you know, whatever you want to use of Indian knowledgeable people when I told them about data privacy in Bangalore, important people said, no, 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 we are going to require them to put their server in India. So I said, how does that matter? Server can be anywhere. The point is who has access to it? Who has access to it? And these servers are mirrored in five, ten places. They have copies here, there, there. So a server in India, how does it matter? It doesn't, the fact that you have your server in your house basement, in your bedroom under the bed, does it make any difference if I have access to it? How do Google accessing their server, they know the encryption, they know how this data is organized. You don't. You have access to it, but it's a bunch of zeros and ones. You can't figure out what the hell it means. So having access means nothing unless you know the algorithm. And for that, you will need to know the source code, which they are never going to give you. So you, since you don't know the software which is accessing the data, just having the raw data makes no sense. So this was a, this was a big news. Is oh okay kind of everyone I go to and say what's your data privacy? They said no no don't worry we've already figured it out. We've told them to put their server here in India. This is such. Second is that the. AI impact is not equally distributed among industries and strata and among regions of the country. So every state should have its own AI strategy. Andhra Pradesh should have its own Andhra Pradesh strategy because your industries are different than Bihar industries, than Bangalore industries. How it will impact is industry specific. You should know for your industry. You should create an AI strategy. I would love to be part of it, but you guys have to take the lead. So, and then you need to in analyze impact by industry and what kind of training you need to give to your people. Then the other thing you hear is, it will create jobs. And, and then, then you, you look, look at the, the fine print. print. Well, I, I have asked question, question. it will create, create jobs, jobs. Are, are you retraining, retraining your people? people? We, 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 they kind of muddle it. So retraining the people requires a lot of money. It is not a simple job. And not everybody is retrainable. So the guy who is in his 40s loses the job. He may not be able to train into this new thing, whereas a guy that at 20s will get the job. So you have disrupted society. In the middle of his life, when he has a family to feed, he's far away from retirement, he loses his job. Maybe somebody younger gets the job, but that is not good enough. So you have to, there's a lot of work to do. And who, have they said, there's no policy which says that when you make so many then that many thousands of people you have to train at your expense into the new into this so that there is an equal one one for one like we are uh, doing for carbon footprint you know you have to uh, do they should be for ai something like that so i i have this kind of an issue another issue i want and i'm throwing open 
I want to hear uh, your solutions also. I want to, I'm not answering all the questions, I'm raising issues also, you guys have to answer. So another one I'm concerned about is that the uh, Indian industry is blindly funding with its philanthropy, it's funding places like Harvard in the study of India, which is strange. Why aren't we studying ourselves? Why do we, we need them to study our, whether we have social justice, whether we have diversity, whether we have religious pluralism? Why do we have to go to Harvard to study Hinduism? Why can't we study our year? What is so, it is so strange. Why do are they the adhikaris of Indian history? I just don't understand this. Why isn't the HRD ministry and the culture ministry and the uh, f f inter international affairs industry doing something about it? Uh, uh, Ministry of External Affairs doing something about it? So we have kind of outsourced a lot of our knowledge about uh, the social sciences and humanities and liberal arts to these people. And so, and the, in, and the Indian industry is backing it. They are, they are backing it. Indian industrialists funded places like Ashoka and Kriya. Godrej Labs, all these kind of places, Azim Premji, Indian industry is funding all this media that is anti-India, a lot of media we've pointed out in this book, we've given examples of these kind of things. So there is a lot of uh, accountability that Indian industry, and I'm not talking about this uh, behind their back, I was in Mumbai, we just came this morning, I was in Mumbai for five days and I just told them very straight, when they asked me what can we do, I said, you the Mumbai guys should go after your industrialists, hold them accountable, and I gave them issues one, two, three, four, five, they should do it. They should at least come out and discuss with us, why are they hiding, why are they not willing to come out? So there is a lot of issues concerning the, while I celebrate that the Vaishya community, which is the economic powerhouse in India, by and large, is doing well, uh, compared to before, we're increasing our share of market, world market, we are getting better in the GDP, this is very good, but we need to worry about the long-term prospects of technology because we are not, we are not an R&D country. The percentage of Indian GDP allocated for R&D is very, very low compared to USA, China, Europe, and all these places. So we are kind of into Jugaad, let's make money quick. I put in money, R&D is risky long-term. And unless you do that, you are in a trap. You'll always be depending on foreign, uh, foreign technology. So that is my, uh, uh, that is my uh, issues, issues with, with, the, the, with the, the Indian businesses. But I do congratulate the Indian businesses for um, giving us more wealth than we used to have when I was growing up. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rajiv ji. <clears throat> Panoramic perspective as always, and uh, I think we could distill that down to three key messages. One is that the slogan, the uh, talk, and the uh, uh, electioneering around inclusive pro prosperity uh, is not possible when the structural dynamics of your economy has negative externalities. And that needs a different kind of thinking. It needs a different kind of policy. The second issue that Rajivji highlighted is that uh, the technological disruption has societal consequences. It is not just happening in the sphere of economy as a silo. It has extremely uh, profound ramifications on the society, especially when you look at the uh, demography, and also the dimension of uh, surveillance state and what that does to the societal psychology itself. And third dimension of uh, lack of strategic thinking uh, in everything related to corporate uh, social responsibility to uh, themes like uh, diversity and uh, equity and inclusion, which have been weaponized, uh, and a complete uh, lack of coherence between civilizational goals and the economic engine. I think those are three big takeaways. Uh, Rajivji, since you called out these dangers, what are the competencies that we need to develop to address this? I think India has very brilliant people. India has exceedingly smart people. Uh, uh, but you know, we have rented out our brains. <laughs> We've rented out our brains to the Americans, the Googles of the world to make technology out of our brains. Because, you know, you somebody we can hire for 10,000 and the Americans are uh, able to pay us 40,000 to get this fellow and some the middlemen make a lot of money. So we think we are doing well because we're creating a middle class, which is true. In China, when they took the same, they had labor arbitrage, so they had a factory worker making little money and replacing the American factory worker making 10 times, so they could make a lot of profit. But the Chinese government told the entrepreneurs, make money, no doubt, but invest at least, say, 25 to 50% into future technologies. 
don't take it home as profit and become rich. You'll make rich anyway. India should have done that. India should have told all these guys, whether it's TCS or Infosys or, um, or uh, it is Mahindra and all these, Azim Premji, making ton of money, becoming billionaires. They would still be billionaires, but less. They should have been told that to put half the money back into futurist technologies. Because you got the cash flow, you got the brain, brainy people. What else do you need? You have to do this. So now, you see, we were told uh, that we are the superpower of software. And now, you know, in AI, we are not in the top 10 in terms of patents. Why is that? How can that be the case? And yet, we, are the, we, are, we have the largest number of AI engineers that we are renting. So on the one hand, we have the largest number of AI engineers we are renting. On the other hand, when it comes to platforms and technologies, whether it's GPT or chat GPT, whether it is uh, you know, some language model, just, uh, some AI model engine or search engine or you know, whatever, social media platforms, we, we don't have any. We don't have the products that come out of the brains, but we have the brains working for somebody else's products. So there is something really wrong this, in this. Uh, uh, this has to be re-strategized. Uh, this is a point I've made 10 years from now, for the last 10 years, and nobody listens. I've made it in Bangalore, and they're sitting there, but they're not doing anything about it. I've made it in the government. They don't want to listen to it. So at, we are paying the price, because you see what's happening is it will take the treadmill will get faster and faster. The amount of money you're going to spend making other people hunt birth, uh, their companies are becoming trillion dollar market cap. There are several companies that are two trillion dollar. They almost touched three trillion before the uh, stock market went down. Now imagine you have a single company, two plus trillion dollars. Wow. Our whole economy is almost like that. Whole economy, they're, they're one company with that much market cap. And this is based on largely Indian brains only. A lot of part of it Indian brains. And this is something you, where you, know, you don't need raw material, you don't need uh, lithium, or you know, it's just brains. And we have that. But we have not used our brains properly. So I would say that's, a, that's one of the major takeaways I would like, is a recalibration of how you utilize Indian brains for Indian technology and increase the share of R&D from industry. Uh, the brilliance of uh, Rajiv ji is, you know, even in short addresses, you gain a lot of insights. And two points that I would uh, like to specifically highlight here. One that he started off with. Uh, on the GDP, we talk about GDP growth, but as Rajiv ji said, do you have a segment-wise analysis of uh, how the GDP is growing for the super rich, the middle class, and then what we popularly call in business jargon as the bottom of the pyramid? I don't think, at least that's the first time that uh, this thought hit me, and I was like, wow, why didn't I ever hear it in ISB or any other business school uh, discussions? The problem, uh, again, is as Rajiv ji said, we've perhaps almost outsourced our brains, we've outsourced our thinking process, which is why original thought very rarely comes through. And uh, this is where I think the problem is, especially with policy making when you interact with the government. And I I'll just make one more point before we can uh, throw it to Raghav or to others who might have questions on this. What Rajiv ji was telling about, you know, uh, how the IT policy or data security policy turned out to be only making servers in India. As someone uh, interacting sometimes a lot with the government and with some of the policy makers, off record, somebody, somebody gave this, this interesting tidbit. He said, he said, you know, how, how this policy, policy came, came, came around that, that, you know, we should get, get the servers, servers in India. He said, more servers in India means more data centers. More data centers means more real estate deals. More real estate deals means more deals for, you know, the select who. And uh, this gentleman said, that is how this policy came about. So even the little bit that has come about, ostensibly might look for uh, one particular reason, but the real intent or the clincher for it could be something else. So I just thought I'll share that <laughs> tid tidbit uh, with you and everyone, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, go to Hanma Chaudhary, sir, to see if he has any comments or questions for us. Actually, I got plenty of comments, but I will restrict myself to most crucial ones. British, the East India Company was the India was won for the East India Company by whom? Indian sepoys. Yes. Indian sepoys. 
won India for Britain. Did any Chinese join any foreign army? No. None. There were the British, there were the Portuguese there, there were the Dutch, there were the French, everybody died, just as in India, but no Chinese ever joined their armies. In it, fact, in fact, uh, Arvind Sharma has done a survey on this and he gave me a list of more than 100 wars of the British fought by the Indian, uh, with the Indian sepoys, 100 wars, Indians working for them. And then in China, they were not able to raise even one or two garrisons because Chinese refused to be recruited under British command. They did not want to work under British command while Indians thought it's a privilege to work under this Gora Saab and carry the Union Jack, uh, you know, that kind of, that's how kind of de depleted of self-esteem we became. And Indians are celebrating that one. Indians are celebrating the conquer, the destruction of the Maratha Empire by a class of people led by the foreigners. Number two thing, you said, I'm, I'm a, a TCS fellow, fellow Tata, Tata Consultancy fellow. fellow. Take, take the top, top five, five companies. companies. The, the annual net, net profit, profit of TCS is 40,000 crores. And the next company, Infosys, 30,000 crores. The top five companies are 20,000 crores and above every year. Nothing in R&D. Now, there are 20 to 25 foreign companies in India using Indian brains to do research for them. We are creating the intellectual property, creating the intellectual property by Indian, but owned by the foreigner. Very good point. That's exactly the point. These, these, these two things I have been writing and talking and uh, educating, etc., etc. Now, the other thing is, you mentioned about the welfare of a government of India. Do you know 80, uh, 80 crores, 80, 80 crores, crores of people, people are being, being fed by, by the government, government of India, India which is 70,000 crores per year, year under, under the food security, security program. program. And the farmers are being given money. Modi ji said that I will double their farms and income. How? By DBT, direct bank transfer, both by the central government and, and the state governments. Both of them give money to farmers and they say, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, the indebtedness of all our state governments is tremendous. As a proportion of the state's GDP, etc. Now, what is going to happen? My state, that is Andhra Pradesh, has borrowed so much money, 80% of the families are getting every year, 80% of the families are getting every year 48,000 rupees into their bank accounts. The government has taken so many loans. Now, I have suggested to them, nobody can pay. If the state-owned banks can write off 10 lakh crores of rupees, for those of those who had swindled the bank for their own benefit, my Jagan chief minister is going to say, I have taken the loans to feed the people for welfare, therefore write off. So this is, this is now Indian, I am calling it painless poverty. We are having painless poverty because gas, LNG is given free, food, 10 items are given free, housing is going to be given free. That is how we are going to keep the unemployed and the poverty and the miserable people away from revolution. And but that only for some time. And continue to vote for us. And that's it. We feed, we feed, you breed, feed and breed. And, and vote. And what? That's what. That, that's what. So we are creating, and the people are going saying, "Hey, the demography dividend, it's a disaster. If it is billions of a billion people, billion people to be fed, clothed, housed, and what? We are, how are we doing? It's a reskilling corporation, Ministry of Reskilling, Ministry for Reskilling these unskillable people." So this is how they do. we are indulging in deception, and if he calls and he bears this, uh, this deception, he will not be given Padmasri.
No, I, I don't want it. No, you don't want it, but even if you want I, I, it. Wait a second. <laughs> Firstly, I will not get it ever, nor anything, any of this, nor do I want it. Uh, at one time, I'll be very honest with you, early in the career, I thought government support would be good because it will build my foundation and where we hiring with some money, one, two, ten, twenty people, we could hire hundred and I could have directed and mentored a thousand people, created a whole army of intellectual chatriyas. I had the youth, I had the vigor, I wanted to do it and I don't want to get paid one penny or get any recognition, but I just want those young people to be paid. I just want the, their expenses to be covered. Nobody helped. Mm -hmm. Now it's too old for me. Who cares? I, I have to worry about my health. Don't worry. I don't, I don't. Dharma, really, dharma, will, dharma will protect you. No. The, uh, <laughs> dharma is protecting me. I'm 92 yes. years young. No, no, you are great. You are, I'm We are proud of you. This is fantastic. But you know, I'll be very honest. Forget my, we are not personally very important people, but look for the desh and the country. Uh, and this is for the next generation. Uh, there, our people are going to get in trouble because China is going to eat our lunch. China, it, what happens when China brings in a few lakh robotic soldiers on the mountains? What will we do with Are we prepared with drone our air force where drones will be like lakhs of these drones? You know, they are the number one in robotics. They are the number one in artificial intelligence. They are trying to be number one in quantum computing, neck to neck with United States. If they can create the quantum computing breakthrough, which they would like to in the next five, six years, it will allow them to break all the codes, all the encryption, and hack all the networks and create havoc. So you see, you may see a very sudden, a sudden shift in India in the situ geopolitical situation. It is not going to be about we are Vishwa Guru and we are G20 head and all this kind of nostalgia and prestige is not going to save our life. Vishwa <laughs> Bhikshu. We may become Vishwa Bhikshu. That become Now, six years ago, I wrote the militarization of space and the weaponization of software. And I sent that paper to the Minister of Defense, etc. That fellow did not have any time. But some Canadian experts also came and said, there is exfiltration of your information, exfiltration of information from India by China. Yes, yes. And there are divisions and divisions in the People's Liberation Army doing this one. But it has not moved. We only hope and pray that the Nationalist Party will win. There are 52 central universities teaching the same nonsense as the state universities. There are no national universities. I am saying there must be national universities which will define, which will produce intellectual warriors for the, like you. They should be produced not like, in America but in like India. Like you. I, like <laughs> anyway, we want national universities. K.M. Munshi, he founded the Bharti Vidya Bhavan. I'm a Bharti Vidya Bhavan man. I was the chairman of Andhra Pradesh. So he said, oh, English is going to be there. It will subvert India. But to know Mahabharata and Ramayana, and all, every knowledge in India should be translated into English. He established the Bhavan Subhuk University. So Indian intellectuals are to be created. We have to have national universities. I am urging upon Modi ji, saying what is the central university? Same botany is taught by the central university as well, the state and the good for nothing, deemed universities also. So we have to have national universities. The intellectual warriors have to be created. We have to take inspiration from persons like him. And uh, uh, we should not create the intellectual property to be owned by other fellows. Just as Indian sepais, not only did they fight for India, for the English company, is going to rule India in the 2047. 2047 at the end of 100 years, who is going to rule India? Think for yourself. The liberalization has unleashed the cage Indian entrepreneurs and they are creating a lot of wealth. But who is for, for whom is that wealth? TCS gave $50 million to Harvard Business School, $50 million. And other fellows like Mahindra, Indra, all of them are giving millions and millions of dollars in order to smash India and to break up India by their researches into our sociology, to widening the fissures in the Indian society. Dhanyawad. Very good. Thank you. Should we see if there are any audience questions? Uh, do we have someone? Do we have a mic there or we can circulate one of these? We can take this.
Good evening, Mr. Raju Malhotra. I think we have been interacting through mails here. I'm Dr. Shiva Prasad Reddy here. Yes. Through thick and thin of COVID-19, we were interacting through mails. I was requesting you to come on my channels. So at least you are here. That's why I had to come here. The first thing is I do agree with you that there is no transparency and accountability. That is the main cause for the rift, what you say, whether it is AI or otherwise. And again, there is a very good book written on data privacy by Ravichandran Swaminathan, who is a web crime analyst, and let me tell you, he is the only one to crack the crypto mystery. I am proud to, or I am privileged to host him regularly on my shows, and you have seen what is happening with crypto now, European Union, now at least India has come forward, you need, to K, you need KYC and all. Why do you need these cryptos? because of the illegalities which are happening at the business front. Those who are honest, we are always there with them. God bless them. And the other major aspect about farmers. I do come by farming sector, farm community. Though we are called, labeled as reddies, we are kapus. Kapudana means agriculture. Believe me, we have given a simple solution. We said no money transfer. Every village or panchayat or a district, you need to have drying yards, along with that warehouses and cold storage for perishable things. 3,000 crores for Telangana, maybe 5,000 now. If you invest, these drying yards along with warehouses and the cold storages, the job is done. You relate the rural youth to transport the material. And then you allow the farmer to have his own price for his produce. For every other product, you have MRPs and all registered by the companies themselves. Why not for farmers? Without farmers, we are not there. Without food, you cannot exist. It is as simple as that. COVID-19. Now, let me come to Chaudhary Garu. With due respects to you, you are a wonderful man. Yeah, yeah, I'm asking you. These are the pertinent things which have been going around. And then my question to you is, do you support capitalist economy or mixed economy like India? Second, Silicon Valley Bank gone, Lehman Brothers before, and the other SVB, which was in the Forbes list, it has gone. Yes, in India, the merging of banks, because they could not address non-performance assets. Had they auctioned that, our Indian banks would have been very happy. Standing here, I am a son-in-law of Kerala, just wanted to buy in front of the Temple One house, mortgaging everything, I don't get loan. And you asked about Sibyl, server should be here. If you have a server, that nativity, as you rightly said, when you said artificial intelligence, that happens when you have control over your resources. Server somewhere else, Sibyl, in US, and our banks, without any order from the government, they are trying to identify your financial resources. I am good with this bank. And I'm not good with Raju Malhotra because of various other factors. But how can you relate without and giving me a notice? This is where, this is where the divide between haves and have-nots have been going around. And one more question regarding Mahindra's also. A company which produces good vehicles, can it have, can it have two or three invoices for registration? When we question them, there is no answer. They don't respond. I want you to respond whether we should have such type of economy where people are just onlookers. Citizens are the constitutional authorities. They own natural resources. But right from panchayat to parliament, they are not, ever, not at all involved. You want such type of economy-driven business households funding political parties. Now, the political parties funding has also become opaque. No citizen can ask any questions. Thank you. So let's move on to somebody who has a question to ask. Because I don't understand this. Is uh, like friends, I request everyone to be brief. Ask one question. And don't ask a question. Shoot Great. series of questions. It is difficult for anybody to reply. And be brief, please. My question is, 
<laughs> would you like to answer? Which economy you would support? Mixed economy or capitalist economy? That was. Let's move on. Okay. You want. Uh, Hello. Sir, as we know that uh, India was the one of the richest country in the world once upon a time. After that, uh, we got freedom and uh, the new constitution given by Ambedkarji. Now the India becoming developing country. It is underdeveloping country like that. Many persons are talking that once India was the developed... What's the question? Uh, my question is, when India, India was the developed country, very rich country, there was Manadharma Shastra, it was followed by India. Now we are not following Manadharma Shastra. So we are going to become underdeveloping country. Now the great KCR sir also said we have to change the constitution what's of India. The, what's the question? The question is, is this constitution is uh, okay for India or we have to change the constitution? Question is, is this constitution okay for India? So then you don't need to give the whole history, just ask the question. See the question, it had nothing to do with developed, is that done. So I, the quest, first of all, the constitution is basically 80-90% a copy of the, what the British wrote in 1935 to rule India. There, it was their system to rule India and we kind of uh, knock out of that, knock off of that is the constitution. It's not done by some original thinkers, it's not an original piece of work. Second is that it is not based on Indian values, it is not a Vedic constitution. It is not uh, this idea of uh, fraternity, liberty, democracy, this, that, is, these are not our ideas in the tradition. We have different ideas. Uh, we have uh, ideas like responsibility, not just rights. Responsibility, dharma is a whole lot of responsibilities. It doesn't, our constitution doesn't talk about that, what your responsibility is. The Western system is full of rights. Can we have one person, uh, okay, then you come here and I will sit there, you can give a lecture, please. So, you know, you have to stop, that's called heckling. There's a difference between a heckler and somebody who wants to discuss and debate. Heckler just shouting here and there. This is not Arnab Goswami's show. Please, we have to, may I continue? Okay. So, this is, so, I, what, what we're talking about. So, this basically, constitution, we're talking about constitution. So, the constitution is neither uh, original, it's a, it's a European derived thing, nor is it uh, based on Vedic ideas, in our own values, it is not a continuity of what our ethos is. And there are many in, uh, flaws in it. So, I, in fact, have asked, uh, we were doing a book launch in Delhi, and there some other people, they were very well-known Hindu thinkers and scholars, very famous people. I asked them, why don't we have a Dharma Shastra for modern Bharat, which would be like the constitution for today? And they kept giving me all these examples of how great we were. We had Pushpak Viman, we had rights for women. I said, I'm not talking about all the practices we had which were great. I'm talking for about a codified document, which is relevant for today. And it took a whole lot of time to even convince them that we do not have this. People don't even think that we are, we are missing this. Unless they realize we are missing a Vedic-based constitution, unless people are convinced of that, nobody is going to start. There is not even a... You can criticize the constitution, but nobody has come up with an alternative saying, this is my position, here is a PDF, a document which is I, I propose, and let's debate it. We don't have an alternative to debate. So that's our situation right now. Sir, uh, I am Padmara Lakaraju, sir. I am National Vice President of All India Prosecutor Association, now standing counsel in high courts. So even the law has become a business, so I am here. <laughs> so, uh, my only qu uh, question is that, that below 10 crores or below 20 crores business houses that are there, who are maximum turnover of 10 crores or 20 crores, it appears that uh, they are facing some inconvenience. What is the shift, the transition, 10 years prior and 10 years now? <clears throat> is my first question, sir. I'm with the, his permission. Second is, I want your valuable comment on the sarcastic or a genuine comment made by Padma Shri Hanuman Chaudhary Garu that we are going to be Vishwa Bhikshu. Thank you. Vishwa what? Bhikshu. India is going to become Vishwa Bhikshu. That one I'll comment on. The first one, I don't have enough knowledge about the Indian economy and the facts. Somebody else can decide. 
I think we are Vishwa Chela. We, we are Vishwa Chela. Uh, and and uh, we are not Vishwa Guru because uh, the West is leading in all these kind of policies. Our policies are being made by them. We are uh, hiring their consultants. Government is hiring consultants right and left. Uh, they are teaching us about our history, about our religion, about our society, uh, the narrative, all the best uh, uh, conferences on India and Indians, all, where every, every scholar wants to go is places like Harvard and Oxford. The PhDs from there on India have more value than PhDs anywhere from India. So our own uh, best brains want to use their... So when we are... Sir, my name is Subaraju, uh, Director of uh, Sisma Life Sciences. Uh, where do you think the lies the problem with the uh, with uneducated politicians who cannot foresee the problems or with the uh, corporates who are not really patriotic for missing this uh, R&D drive? So, the, yeah, it's a, I think it's a very good question. The, certainly the corporates are taking advantage of the fact that there is no oversight. If, if there is no oversight on the part of the government on, on, you know, where you invest your money for philanthropy, are you funding the wrong people, there's nobody producing a report on it, nobody putting them, on, you know, on the spot like, uh, uh, until we came along and did it. So they are taking advantage of the fact that nobody is bothered. So they, are, they should have their own conscience. They should say whether government is pushing me or not, I have a, I'm a man of conscience. In India, I'm going around saying I'm a patriotic person. I've been rewarded, awarded, all kind of stuff. And I made my billions here on the back of the Indian economy and with the help of Indian labor. So I should at least be loyal to my own country. They should have that moral conscience from within, even without government having to put danda on them. This is, but this has not happened. So somebody has to put pressure. If government, without mentioning any particular person, I will tell you, a very important person told me that we cannot tell these billionaires what to do with their money because we also depend on their funding. We depend on their funding during elections. Very big. Every party depends on these guys. They are running the show because they can put money here, there, they got enough money. So you cannot criticize them. That's media is not independent because many of them own the media also. Media is owned by private people, uh, these business houses. True, so true. where is the accountability going to come? That is the thing. It, it can only come from public pressure. True, sir. Thank you, sir. Maybe while if there is no, no more question. My name is Madhava. I am Global Delivery Director from Infosys. I have a question. How can we change currently the Indian education system? What are your suggestions? So education system is a very big topic. There is school level, there is college, higher level and all that. NCRT hasn't done its job because they have not changed any curriculum. I don't know why they haven't done their job. You, it, they keep passing the buck. You ask the NCRT guys, they say, we have uh, tried, uh, PMO office never approved anything. We don't know what the inside politics is, why they won't do it. You know, and then you look at uh, UPSC exam, it hasn't changed. They're still teaching the same, you know, Romila Thapar and Irfan Habib kind of material. That is what they're teaching. <coughs> Then you look at higher education, the NEP is full of holes because in the area of liberal arts, it is basically promoting Western liberal arts. It's opened the floodgates for those guys. I've criticized this for a long time, saying that unless you Indianize the study of India, the opening it to Harvard type people to come is actually making it worse. And then to make it even worse now, in the last month or month and a half, the UGC, in the last couple of months, UGC has uh, invited foreigners to foreign universities to set up campuses. 
Now, the foreign university campus has been told that you will not have any restrictions on what you can teach, but the Indian universities have restrictions on what they can teach. Foreign universities have been told you will not be, have restrictions on who you can hire as professor, but Indian universities cannot just hire anybody they want. There are restrictions, there are regulations. The foreign universities have been told you can pay any salaries you want. Indian universities cannot pay any salaries they want. There are regulations. Foreign universities have been told you can pay, charge any tuition you want. Indian universities cannot. So in, the Indian universities are regulated and, and by the UGC, but they've given a free ticket to the foreign. This is so stupid. There should at least be a level playing field. And, and you know, they should bring in foreign universities only for STEM because that's technology transfer into India. We do not need foreign universities to come and teach Indian history and Indian social problems and Indian political this, that, are we democracy, not democracy, none of their business. And why are we asking them to brain, brainwash our next generation? It will make it even worse. Instead of uh, for every one uh, child who can afford to go to Harvard, there'll be 20 who can afford to go local, pay local uh, uh, fees. So I think this is a very foolish, uh, choice and it has to be you the public has to stand up and talk about it we have spoken the, before anybody has spoken we are writing on, on this NEP became like the favorite everybody is sloganing we are great because we've got NEP but the people didn't read in detail what it says With your permission, can I add? <laughs> new education policy permitting foreign universities to have local uh, presence is extension of Article 30 in the Constitution. Article 30 in the Constitution says the minorities can establish any type of, any number of educational institutions outside government rules. So this is an extension for the foreign universities. They are free to do whatever they want, just like Indian minorities. So Article 30 must be, <laughs> and so many others. So, so, so it means that a powerful place like Harvard will have more rights than an Indian. Correct. Very, this is very so strange. That's what the minorities are having in India now. This is so bizarre. Uh, coming from the education sector now, I'll take this opportunity to make a quick comment uh, on uh, NEP and what Rajiv ji said. This is the exact danger that even some of us tried to point out in the draft policy, that 500-page document which very few people would have taken the pains to read. And there's one thing uh, the government is trying to set up. Uh, now you have IIMs for management, you have IITs for technology. The government is going to set up IILAS, Indian Institute of Liberal Arts and Sciences. And not only that, uh, the other partners, they've said there should be no standalone STEM college. So all IITs, IIMs, they are being forced to start liberal arts. And like Rajiv ji said, all this liberal arts curriculum is again going to come from Harvard's and all, which is against our national interest. Now, the sad part is it's coming in the government, which a lot of us would like to call our government. So. Uh, I think a lot of people, the only reason why I thought I'll use this opportunity to make that comment is because there are a lot of influential people here who would have some levers to pull in the government. So perhaps you can pay a little attention to it and do try and do whatever you can on that front. So one of the books we just came out with that's available here is called The Battle for IITs. So that will tell you the danger of social sciences running, uh, making policies on technology because the battle for IITs has come from American social sciences and social justice and the afro dalit movement and critical race theory, all these kind of things. On their, their assessment of IITs as a problem and why IITs should be dismantled because they are casteist and they are elitist and they are suppressing minorities, all this nonsense. So what we will have is more of this kind of stuff. More of this kind of stuff is coming. And by the way, uh, the new US ambassador to India is a breaking India force. It is very clear. When they, you know, sometimes the Americans float a rumor to see what's the reaction. And if the reaction had been very negative, they might not have put him. I wrote, I'm the only person who wrote 
that this guy would be dangerous for India. He, what his background is, what his ideology is, he is into this wokeism. He's, uh, he's going to create a, a batak for Khalistanis to come and have a seminar in the embassy. What will you do? He'll have a meeting with this caste and that caste and this minority as if he's the new minority commission and as if he's the in charge of human rights. Uh, instead of people sitting in America yelling at India and putting the pointing the finger that you don't have democracy and you don't have your religious freedom. Now we'll have their ambassador sitting here doing all this stuff. And I mentioned this in an art articles. No Indian newspaper was willing to publish my article. When the first news came out that this guy may might be, you know, might be the one several a few months ago, I if people had written I wanted to come on TV shows and whatever and say all this. If people had made enough noise, then they might have said, okay, maybe we'll uh, change this, you know, because it's not going to be well received. But once it becomes official, you cannot fight. So this is real. It is going to happen. Indian government cannot refuse this guy coming because we were sleeping. We didn't pay attention. You see, we don't have a research department. In the Indian, go Indian government, we don't have a research department. The moment somebody's name came up, they should have quickly put it on the research people and said, in 48 hours, give me a report on this guy. And we should have people who can do that. We, could, we wanted to do this. But there's no takers. So now this will be a very serious problem in India because U.S. ambassador with all the diplomatic rights and all the diplomatic privileges, a, a quad ally, is going to sit here and start demanding all these things that we are fighting. But now it will happen from Indian soil. That's what Pakistan embassy is doing. They are giving uh, visas and permits, etc., to Khalistanis and all breakers of India. Vigilance. Eternal, the price of democracy is eternal vigilance. That's what we are lacking. Any other questions that we have from the audience, or we'll have Raghav, you have any questions? Have we'll take how many? One or two? But, uh, kindly make it if it is related Very to... Very brief question, just one question from the audience. Yeah. Just, I would, uh, you are loud enough, you can proceed. Every day we are a list, just to, our children are giving credit. All Indians are my brothers and sisters. Isn't it? If brothers and sisters, we are giving same import to the brother and sister or everyone. In the education system, you are showing more partiality to the rich people and poor people. I mean, every government is taking a decision for the higher education for the higher people. But in villages, there is no roads, there is no schools. Is it comparison? Is it comparison between the brother and sister? So, if you have a quick question, you can ask. Otherwise, this is a is comment. We can take this will, comment later on. Will you give this answer for the poor people? Uh, this is this is an industry business forum. You are making a comment. You, if you have a question, yeah. Raghav, anything that you would like to? <clears throat> okay. So no, no, I I just want to say I have tremendous sympathy for the poorest of this country. I have tremendous sympathy, and I will. And if there is any concrete proposal that will help them, I will support it. I, I look for you to come up with ideas, write me th your proposal, not complain, but what you want to propose, and maybe we'll work together and we'll write something together, because I really, really feel that the bottom has to be helped, otherwise you will have a revolution, otherwise your, the amount of money you go on spending to keep them happy will become too much for the country. So you have to uplift them for the sake of national unity also and humanitarian reasons. So I, I'll just make one comment on behalf of Rajivji, just for background sake in case it's not known. He is a multimillionaire, billionaire who's, you know, dedicated his life to giving back to the society and for the country, sponsoring so many research items and so many intellectual kshatriyas, that, that's a different field. So No, I, I, I was, but I no longer am. Yeah, so I think that says it all. I don't need to add anything more there. Can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Yeah. Was there yeah. any time in the history of mankind when there were no poor people? You're absolutely right. Not only... Well, also there was never a history, never a century of peace. They keep talking about world peace. There had never been world peace. 
I always, so you know, you have to accept that there will be gadar, there will be uh, exploitation, but we have to keep fighting it. There will be enemies. You cannot escape from it and assume that, okay, you know, all is well or all will be well because that's not going to happen. That is just not going to happen. Is there one country out of the 192 members of the United Nations where the rich poor gap is not increasing? Sir, Namaste. I'm Venugo Paladi. Uh, now, the situation is prevailing in such a way, if government wants, they can uh, certainly frame some case against any industrialist. In some way, they can put behind bars in any way. So, this condition is prevailing in every country or only in India. Is it the reason for many of the Indian business people are uh, migrating to foreign countries? Thank you. I, I'm not uh, the most knowledgeable person here to talk about whether it is true or not true that any any businessman can be put behind bars and so on. I don't know if that is true. What do, you, what do you think? Me neither. Uh, any, 90 percent can be done, put. That's what is happening now. Uh, all the organs of the state are being used as hounds to do catch these fellows. So may I be permitted to make a comment? It's not a question. Because two times it has slipped. My question was that, uh, which uh, Rajuji has said that uh, he is not uh, having much idea, and the same question, similar type of question has come. What I have seen from my, who are my good friends, who are, at, uh, who are doing business less than this 10 crores and 20 crores, the inconvenience that they are facing is, the laws have become strict. <clears throat> that is making them breathless, because they are accustomed to flout the laws. There is a proverb, uh, I don't know, I'm not generalizing it. Dande mein paise nahi hai, tax evasion mein paise hai. Now tax is tightened. And having worked as a prosecutor for such a long time and being in the prosecution and a member of international National prosecutors, the problem that is happening is the SFO, serious fraud offenses, the financial, these industries, I, I don't blame all the industrial sector, because of them we are surviving. They are giving a lot of employment. They are taking the burden of the country. I always respect them. But some industrial houses, which are accustomed to do the frauds, are being grilled. And they are being exposed on day-to-day -day basis. So I am handling those kind of cases also. Now they are developing cold feet to do the fraud. That is the transitional change which in my little knowledge I observed before 2014 and after 2014. Thank you. That's a good change. Sir, India's yes cartoonist Lakshman once wrote a cartoon. A politician is saying we make laws to protect the interests of the poor. We leave loopholes to protect the interests of the businessmen. <laughs> that was a cartoonist Lakshman. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, before we break for dinner, I have a very small announcement. We are having our annual Puraskar, which will be conferred on Sri Raju Malhotraji on 15th March. We have the function in Center for Economic uh, 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 CESS, which is at Amir Pet, where the invitation will be sent to you by WhatsApp message. I request all of you to please come and attend that. Time is 6.30. We also have a whole range of books uh, brought out by say, Raju Malhotraji, and they are available at a special discount for today. Yeah, I'll just take the pleasure of, uh, or the honor of having the last comment here, since there are a lot of influential businessmen and industrialists here. Uh, one request, they would not be able to say it, I'll say it on their behalf. Uh, we briefly touched upon the topic of uh, a lot of businessmen donating to institutions like Harvard and other institutions. Uh, there's a lot of documentation on the perils of it, and there is perhaps not uh, any or very little documentation on how you can counter that by supporting institutions like, let's say, Infinity Foundation or Brahat from which uh, Raghav comes, even Pragna Bharti. So just with a request uh, on behalf uh, of the dais that whenever you give out any CSR funds, the traditional thought 
these kind of intellectual domain or intellectual exercises, uh, they don't come into that domain. So do give a thought towards that. And before trying to donate to any well-known university, or I would rather use the word so-called well-known universities and intellectuals, do look at uh, the institutions like Infinity Foundation, Brahat and Pragna Bharti, next time you sign a check for anyone. That's the only request that I'd like to make. And would like to... I just Thank. want to say one thing, for the record, Infinity Foundation has never received even one rupee of CSR. Just want you to know the facts. I think that that's a powerful statement and we'll end on that note uh, with a word of uh, gratitude and thanks for Rajiv ji, Hanuman Chaudhary ji and everybody else who's uh, come and uh, participated here. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Uh, good evening all. Uh, thank you. Uh, to the elderly gentlemen, both uh, Saraswati Putra, uh, Dr. Hanuman Chaudhary Garu, and Rajiv Manatraji, and the other two gentlemen sitting on either side, uh, Ashish Naredi and Raghav, to uh, conduct this. And thank you all the gentlemen who have come and asked such an interactive, uh, uh, such good questions for a very interactive session this evening. Uh, thank you all. The dinner is open, and let's have some good dinner for the evening. Thank you. <laughs>